Okay, welcome everyone to the fifth ELX event. Uh, a big shout out to all of you here today who braved the rate and the traffic. I um, appreciate you all coming. Um, again, it's awesome to see a lot of new faces in the audience. So please help spread the word and share with your peers in the industry ELX and let's get this even bigger. Um, our goal is to make ELX the meetup of choice for leaders in the industry. So with your help, we will get there. First off, I'd like to start by acknowledging and paying respects to the traditional owners of the land on which we conduct our gathering today. We respect, respectfully acknowledge their ancestors and elders past and present and those who arrive into the future. We also acknowledge the traditional custodians and their ancestors of the lands and waters across Australia where we conduct our business. On behalf of the ELX leadership team, I'd like to thank Addy who is not here and he's uh, sent me a Slack message yesterday saying, I do apologize, I've double booked myself, it's Jewish holidays, I'm out for dinner. Thanks, thanks, Addy. Um, but I'd like to say a, a big thank you to Kate from Zero at the back taking pictures, thank you, Kate. Um, Graham from Unicorn X also at the back drinking beer, nice. Um, and obviously Latitude, um, just to let you guys know, we are not Latitude Financial. We have not had a data breach. So just, just in case you get confused. No, we know. Yeah, <laughs> yet. Um, about ELX, um, I, I pretty much say this at every ELX event, um, but as we have a new few phrase, faces here, I wanted to share why ELX was created. So ELX is a meetup um, that has been designed for managers through to CXO to allow leaders to learn from one another and grow in a safe and open forum. And yes, we do try and queue it, well, we basically do QA the people who join um, to try and keep it exclusive for leaders. So, so that's the purpose of, um, I guess, the ELX. Uh, we encourage you guys to put your hands up, ask questions, so please don't be shy. Uh, we will kick off uh, proceedings with questions into the audience. As you can see on the pillars around you, there is a QR code. If you could kindly have a snap of that at some point, um, you can also vote for the next ELX event and what that looks like. So when you get a chance, please uh, put your votes in. Okay, so today we welcome three fantastic speakers to kick off ELX 5 on a topic that has been on every social media outlet today. And that is the passing of Tina Turner and the legend that she was, rest in peace, Tina. But no, on a serious note, let me introduce you to tonight's speakers um, as we go down a rabbit hole of AI. On our left, we have Mr. Rick Green, the group manager and data analy analytics at Workwear Group. Woo. We have Fred, the GM of enterprise data at PEXA. Yeah, Fred. And we have Brent, the director and data and AI at Deloitte. Now I'll hand over to our colleague and today's MC. You will all know him from the other ELXs, Mr. Will Weatherall, the GM of Latitude IT. GM. Ooh. Put that one in. Yeah. Um, who, in fact, uh, who, well, GM and specializes in data and security. So feel free to ask Will any pointed questions as we go through today's uh, talk. Um, and yeah, look, let's kick off. So this is ELX5 AI's transformative potential, exploring the meaning for business and roles. Over to you, Will. Thank you very much, James. So, there was a, uh, there's an amazing philosopher of the modern era who is renowned for his soul searching, existentially challenging questions. His name is Ali G. And he asked a question once that really struck a chord with me. He said, technology, is it good or is it whack? <laughs> and tonight we're going to answer that question with specific uh, focus on AI, the sharp end of the pointy tech spear. Uh, we are witnessing the evolution of our species or perhaps even the birth of a new one. And at times like these, we need to be asking challenging questions. If Steve Irwin were here tonight, he'd probably say, that's AI, the most amazing and dangerous technology in the world. Let's get closer. <laughs> Before we find out a little bit more about our speakers, as you know, this is all about you. We're here to answer your questions. I'm sure if you come here tonight, you have 
things you want to talk about, you have questions you want answered, burning issues and so forth. So before we begin, I would like to call on my beautiful assistant, James, to perhaps take his, his pen out and write down some, some, some points from the audience, some questions perhaps that you'd like our lovely panel to address. Don't be shy. And by the way, if you can't think of anything right now, just put up your hand whenever you're inspired to ask a question and it shall be answered. Has anyone got any AI related uh, topics or questions or anything like that they'd like to have answered this evening? Yes, sir. Yes. Yeah. It seems like some of the more mature businesses are trying to slow down because of the privacy concerns and what's going to be needed for them and much smaller players to speed up. You catch that, James? Beautiful handwriting. He writes in all capitals. He's always shouting. It's very disturbing. Anyone else like to uh, nominate a few topics they'd like covered? You, sir, in the front. I'd like to find out what your thoughts are on timeframes for when we'll really be seeing big changes to the way we're working in business, particularly writing software. Thank you very much. Well captured, James. Anyone else? You, sir. Thank you for participating. Thanks. I'll uh, want to understand more in terms of how do you test applications uh, you know, that are built uh, using AI? and you know, test it, and especially data related in terms of if the organization does not have structured data and things like that, how do you go about it? Excellent question. Look forward to that one. Anyone else? Don't be shy. You, sir. Yeah, there's been a lot of talk about short-term changes we're making to organizations to support AI, but um, are any of your organizations or any you know of starting to think about the long-term changes you're planning to put into place? Excellent. Very good. Look at that. We've got four already. Can we get to six? Elzan. Uh, what do you think realistically, uh, if we fast forward a couple of years, what the capacity gains could look like if we start using AI in engineering solutions? Excellent. Very good. Oh, there we go. Young lady, Lucia. Lucia, is it? There you go. Oh, I'm not sure whether the legislation comes under the privacy, but how does, is there any type of legislation for using these types of products at the moment or like when you're building your software? Very good question. Legislation. Excellent. That's good. That sums it up. Anyone else? Was that almost a hand going up over there? Okay. Awesome. Great. Well, uh, let's kick off then. We've got some very interesting topics we need to cover and time flies when you're having fun so perhaps before we get stuck into that and go down the rabbit hole rick if you could tell us a little bit more about you what you do and what your relationship with ai has been to date that would be awesome thank you okay can everyone here yep cool awesome um so rick uh work at uh, workwear group which is part of well, it's a very small part of uh, west farmers most people haven't heard of it although you will have heard of some of the brands so hard yakka king g and whenever you see any of your sort of you know, emergency services, all their uniforms and stuff, that's what Workwear Group sort of produces. So anyone that spends big on uniforms. Um, previously to that, uh, Coles, there's a couple of Coles alumni here tonight uh, who have also survived it. Um, so um, in terms of AI, I uh, was working in the AI or advanced analytics team at Coles where we did a lot of uh, forecast engines, uh, range optimization and things like that. Um, also in West Farmers now over the last 18 months, it's really sort of setting the scene or getting uh, workwear group ready for AI or data science. Um, probably more machine learning initially than AI itself. Um, but with sort of, I guess, the, the recent sort of uh, changes in that environment, which we're sure we'll be discussing tonight, um, you know, that sort of opens up a whole sort of different sort of set of options. Thanks a lot, Rick. Fred, who are you and what do you do? And tell me I, about your relationship with AI. Yeah, so Fred Hersman, um, I'm the general manager of enterprise data at Pixel. Uh, prior to that, I was the head of data and analytics at Deluxe Group, uh, the paint company. 
and, and really was responsible for all our machine learning data science initiatives over there from very fine-grained molecular compound forecasting to um, optimization, you know, across the supply chain. At PEXA, you know, we're an exchange for property settlements within Australia, um, the, the largest by far. Um, and clearly we sit with the asset in our data that's pretty unique um, across the Australian market where we, you know, pretty much know about all the property transactions that happen um, in Australia. And um, we see that as a very competitive asset and AI clearly needs data to feed it. So um, a part of my responsibility is nurturing this asset for artificial intelligence and um, AI in future. Thanks a lot, Fran. Brent. Uh, yep, Brent Whelan. So I'm uh, now a director in data and AI at Deloitte. That's actually relatively fresh, but um, I've pretty much spent the last uh, probably almost 20 years um, building and designing sort of data platform and solutions for AI use cases. So really around uh, decisioning, um, you know, working with organizations to be able to mature up to the, the scale of being able to look at, you know, embedding AI into their core procedural um, uh, processes. And uh, that's from, you know, banking to telecommunications to energy of, of being kind of uh, around a lot of industries over the, the years. And I uh, run up a special engineering team to be able to build those platforms for that use. Excellent. Now, you said tw 20 years. Um, yes. Okay, wow. So um, I guess as a sort of uh, a layman, it seems to me as though suddenly we're in this AI rush hour, but in actual fact, it's been around for a very long time. So definitely what we call AI today is personally, like there's been a huge advancements, but it is machine learning, which was the, the brand that we were using prior to that. And then you had data science and, and analytics and uh, obviously business analytics was the first kind of term that was very much used uh, but all of those kind of now have pivoted to to AI so I'm um, all the way back from you know probably in early parts of my career I was working in uh, a department doing optimization and, and analytics so yeah okay so we, we're here today to talk about uh, AI's transformative potential in business, but it seems as though it might be a good place to start if we sort of go back in time a little bit and start at the beginning. Like what has, where is AI around us? Where do we see it? And, and how has it, what impact has it had? How has it transformed the world we live in so far? Like perhaps maybe if you could give us a bit of an overview, a summary of our history of AI. <laughs> Uh, just I can give you a, a brief kind of idea around you know there's the the concepts that we use in AI and machine learning have been embedded in in solutions across the board um, for for many many years. Obviously now there's the huge marketing aspects of you know chat with GDP and the, all those sort of things that have come up now and and you've got you know obviously big banks and stuff who are going to build these large uh, language models. But prior to that, it it really was around you know, finding smart ways statistically to make decisions in an automated fashion. And so, you know, rules engines was kind of the first things that were coming up and that was really kind of doing what AI now does today. Um, but it, it is embedded everywhere at the moment. So, you know, you take a photo on your phone with your, your Pixel phone and it's running a, a huge amounts of, you know, what you would class as AI or machine learning models to do that. Um, medical mapping, you know, all those sort of uh, aspects are now part and parcel around AI. So it's not it's not new. Um, these models have just got really, really big. Yeah, fantastic. Thank you very much. The big changes has been trust. Like, do you believe yeah. that we we're trusting what's coming out of this now? Uh, we shouldn't. Um, in all honesty, so, um, it, but definitely there's certain things, right? There's little things that it doesn't matter, right? And this is the question of, you know, when you use AI and when you use machine learning, is it an appropriate use case for the technology there? And is the user that's absorbing that knowing that it's, do they need to know that it's there? Does it make a difference to their life? Like if your you know, photo's been enhanced by AI, it doesn't really matter. 
as long as it's not doing silly things. But you know, but if you are getting a piece of information that's come off Wikipedia that was filled incorrectly, but you don't know it's coming from Wikipedia, that's a problem. Huge problem. What do we what do we do about that? Like as as new adopters, and we're all trying to adopt it in some shape or form, whether it's me using it for a position description or Alzan's writing a new strategy, what should I should I, should I trust or not trust? Education is yeah. <laughs> Education starts with uh, with the kids, I guess. Um, Rick, tell me, how in your industry or the industries you work with, how do you see AI transforming things and what would you say are the key challenges and key opportunities that you see at the moment? Yeah, I think so far to date, it's been very incremental, you know, sort of, Incrementally over time, we start to see these machine learning algorithms and models being used across the businesses, you know, marketing use cases that next best offer on the website, all that sort of stuff, you know, we just become accustomed to and used to. Um, we sort of see that through, you know, customer experience and things like that, um, especially in retail and things like that. But, um, you know, increasingly more as people become more, I guess, data aware or data literate, um, you know, business is starting to, I guess, demand more. From this, you know, they sort of sometimes see it as a bit of a nirvana, um, you know, expecting probably too much, um, particularly from some of the, the systems and data that uh, companies have. But um, we're seeing a growing appetite, and you know, that's really been exacerbated um, in the gold mining industry, chat GPT and stuff like that, where people are actually, you know, able to interact with it quite well and see and sort of nearly build trust in it, although they probably shouldn't be. <laughs> um, just because it's really you know tangible to them now, they can really sort of start to envisage what you know some some of these applications may be in the future. And we're we're really at a, an amazing juncture where no one really knows exactly where this is going to go, but there's a huge volume of sort of innovation that's going on. Okay, you you mentioned uh, customer experience. Would you mind unpacking that a little bit? Yeah, so I think you know everyone in their everyday lives, anyone who shops on Amazon or whatever, you know, you've got. A whole heap of machine learning algorithms sitting in there behind there it, it's part of that customer experience whether it's you know, hey anyone who bought this you know is, is also buying this you know presenting up different offers or that next best option for you to buy or whether it's you know the shipping algorithms and behind the scenes you know tracking where everything is telling you when you know estimating when it's going to be there and you know it's, we've become accustomed to that sort of service you know you, you know when you go and buy something not amazon or you know someone who's got that sort of good estimation of service you're like oh geez this is a really clunky sort of service and you know we become accustomed to all these things sitting in behind the scenes yeah we get used to stuff super quick don't we yeah oh, for sure wow fred what about you same question for you if you wouldn't mind in terms of the industry that you're in the industries that you're working with how how are you witnessing ai's transformative potential and what do you as see as the key challenges and uh, the key opportunities yeah, it's it's um, it's it's been incremental over time, but what we're seeing now is a really big shift in the capabilities of these large language models. Previously, um, I believe the applications have been really limited and narrow in their nature, uh, and what's happening now is these models seem to be almost general purpose, right? They seem to be able to do deductive and inductive reasoning. They seem to be able to you know dream up and hallucinate and do things that we normally attach to human beings right and so you get this false sense of security that maybe there's intelligence you know behind that and um but any like anything that's general purpose electricity for instance you know that really can revolutionize a number of industries um for us you know we're a, a software company we're a platform we've got copilot um that's running you know, a large language model in there that makes our uh, developers really productive uh, and sometimes maybe naive about their code as well. Um, but it, it's changing the way that we humans interact with machines. Um, I was interested in, in the timeline question, but, you know, I wonder about interfaces in the future and how that, how interfaces will be shaped by a natural language type of interface uh, instead of a, 
programming language or the graphical interface. Uh, I think we're at a very interesting juncture where the general purposeness of the AI models now are being applied in many areas. You mentioned uh, inductive and deductive reasoning, is that correct? What, what, That's right. So, um, pardon my ignorance, but um, what is inductive reasoning as opposed to deductive reasoning? So it's either you start from the premise and work your way down, or you start from you know, inductively making uh, hypotheses and assumptions and work your way up to the premise. So you can do either both, either way, inductively or deductively. Okay. And so if I ask AI, for instance, given these two articles, um, you know, ChatGPT, GPT-4 does this, given the, this information over here, write, deduct, in, deduct from that, for me, the best answer to this question. It seems to be able to do that. Right, okay. And that, so that creates the appearance of intelligence, but it's, it's, not, it's, it's not actually intelligence. Is that what you're saying? Like it, it doesn't, it's not creative on its own. It just uses what you feed it. It's not it's, spontaneous. It's, it's very interesting. And uh, you know, even OpenAI, Microsoft, their research paper, they don't 100% know. Uh, what what's really happening is it's you know predicting tokens in a series, but if you just think about that, what am I doing when I'm talking right now? I am predicting the next word, meaning I need to understand the context in which to predict that next word. So is it somehow understanding context to be able to predict? Uh, this is this is a deep question, yeah. Yeah, because it touches, you know, thinking in general. Um, how does that work? How do we learn? We don't learn through backpropagation, you know, but these models do. Right. So they seem like they can think for themselves, but they can't actually. But well, we don't know. We don't. And know. that's why it's scary. That's that's why it's scary, and that's okay. why that's why there's a lot of regulation being asked to come in and you know stop this. Now I hope there's not somebody in there. I hope there's there's not a consciousness in one of these trapped. We don't know. But what happens in five years from now when these language models are really large? We've got silicon that makes you be able to do inference at a really cheap rate. Where are we then? I, I don't know. Normally in the movie, this is the period of time when we look back and say, um, yep, they should have hit the pause button there. <laughs> but we don't know if that's, that's the case. There's a lot of media, a lot of hype about it. It's interesting that these models have gone closed source as well. That's the other very, very interesting thing for me. You're freaking me out a bit. I got <laughs> I to I gotta admit it. Um, so... If these models are, if we, they're constantly training, right? These, these models, we're training them. When we use them day in, day out, when we're on chat GPT, every time we use it, we're helping it get smarter, right? Uh, or our HF, okay. reinforcement from human feedback. Okay. So that means that the, their ability to become more and more intelligent is infinite and increases exponentially. So we're right to be. If they're intelligent, I don't know. What is yeah. intelligence? Like, that's a good question. <laughs> Uh, uh. <laughs> they're good at predicting next words that right. make them seem like they're intelligent right okay okay Oof, that's a relief i just seem intelligent everybody relax brent what are you seeing like from a transformative potential in your industry uh you work in consulting you're working with under other industries a lot you're you're outward facing as it were how are you seeing this go down from a challenge and uh, opportunity perspective? I'll start talking about internally. Like we use a lot of these tools internally to improve productivity. Uh, Copilot, um, it, you know, my sneaky developers in my last job decided to install that and start using it without telling me first. Um, and so they got, you know, 10, 20% productivity gains and played a lot of table tennis. Um, <laughs> that was fine. Uh, so definitely the, the internally, there's a lot of you know, questions about it being a strategy organization as well. You, know, you look at many things and you kind of trying to work out, well, what, you know, comparing all these things, what's the best recommendation for this client in this area? So that, that is definitely going to have a transformational impact on the consulting world as a whole. 
Um, the, the then question is, you know, what, what is it going to do to our clients? Um, it's, it, it will have huge impact in different places. Um, the big question is where can they use it? And you know, there's a there's a there's a lot of questions about you know, ethics around that, and and that's a real big unknown at the moment. And I think that's the thing that will get unpicked over the next couple of years, because if you go and use it and it's not ethical, you know, it's not treating your customers the same way, or it, we've had the same problem in in basic machine learning models. Um, that's been a big stopper for a lot of organisations to be able to use these technologies. This is even more opaque around that. We never really solved the problem for machine learning as, a, as it was you know, a few months ago. Um, I'm not sure whether we're going to get there with this just yet. And it may really make it very niche use cases that are, again, really question, well, if I do it for this, is this ethical and is this going to impact anyone in different ways? And that's where we're going to start. I think the uh, topic of ethics and AI is something that we could have an entire um, ELX session on on its own. Um, as AI is being used more and more for decision making, how can organizations ensure that measures are being embedded in AI systems to prevent things like discrimination and bias? Rick, what are your thoughts on that? I think you hit a really interesting point. The, the, you know, the biases in data are obviously a huge concern. You know, you only need to sort of I think years ago. There's a, a sort of person, a Kathy O'Neill from I think she goes under the monkey or sort of mass babe. She wrote a book called Weapons of Mass Destruction, and it was very much focused on this. And um, you know, in America, you have sort of sentencing sort of software that you know does a sentencing sort of thing, but you've got this huge history of racism. You know uh, that's been fed into it so you know if you're a black male 20 20s you know the outcomes from that model are going to be pretty pretty uh heavily weighted against you sort of thing so you know having it's going to be a really huge challenge for companies especially when you're looking at historical sets of data you know, what are the behaviors in there that we need to sort of be uh, i guess aware of that the model could be picking up on and reinforcing um, and sometimes self-reinforcing you know we sort of we we're just talking earlier um, before this, that uh, you know, with chat GP, uh, GPT and stuff like that, you know, how long till it starts to consume its own information through the web at some point in time and you know, starts to spiral down some sort of pathway, sort of thing? So, you know, having a really good handle on this data, really good governance of that data, and a really good understanding of it's going to be really critical to making sure we don't end up, you know, these really perverse or unusual bias outcomes in the model. That's a very interesting point. You've just uh, made me think of something. Um, if you, some people say that um, social media has been one of our first battles with AI, and we lost it um, because of the way in which, uh, although it, of course, it's very useful in certain ways, like any tool, depends on how you use it, it can be very useful. But some would say that it has also created a lot of division, We've never been, ironically, social media, yet we've never been more divided. We've never been more atomized. We find ourselves in echo chambers, yeah, reinforced biases and so forth. So that's the concern that you're talking about, that after a while, we'll, it'll begin to just kind of um, sort of program itself on its own regurgitated data, yeah, essentially. That, that or even, you know, you could weaponize it in a sense, you know, if you're in America in the, you know, the, the, the divide of the two political parties, you know, you might stand up some sort of platform that's sort of just self-reinforcing your ideology in terms of being a Republican or a Democrat or something like that. And, you know, you, you can have, it sort of really takes that sort of misinformation or biasy of information to that next level potentially. So, um, you know, there's definitely considerable risk there from an ethical sort of viewpoint. So. Um, yeah, it's going to be intriguing to watch how we combat that and, you know, can legislation and things like that keep up with it? You know, does that stymie the in, in innovation around it? You know, there's, there's going to be some really interesting debates, particularly because it's exploded so much over the last six months. You know, regulation always has to try to catch up. Um, but sometimes, you know, we're talking about social media, you know, it just gets away from it. Absolutely. Absolutely. Fred, what are your thoughts on the whole question of ethics and AI? 
I guess eth ethics is so subjective as, as well, right? What is ethical for me is not ethical for you or vice versa. That's right. Uh, that's a, it's a good question and observation, but I'm more a little bit interested as where does liability really sit? Who Who is liable? Um, if I use a data set that's open source, you know, I've, and it's available on the internet and my model is trained off this, who's, who's liable for those outcomes? You know, those ethical outcomes? I don't know, is society liable? I just use the data to train the model. Um, the arbiters are becoming the tech firms and uh, regulation is not catching up fast enough for this. So I, I think it's the first time ever where industry has gone to the regulators and said, hey, please intervene here. I don't think that's ever happened before. And it tells you that there's something different about this, something different about the ethical use, something different about liability, um, something different about society and the use of this in general uh, for good and bad. Yeah, absolutely. I'm reminded of the, uh, the guy who invented the nuclear bomb. He said, I've become the destroyer of worlds. It's a bit like that. They're sort of horrified by what they've built. Well, not horrified, but just um, slightly alarmed and wanting to hit the pause button, which is kind of uh, a bit um, spooky, unsettling to say the least. And when the brightest minds in the world are saying, hey guys, can we just take a breather for six months while we figure out what we should do about this? Because it's moving so damn quick. There's all these questions that remain unanswered. The quickest way to get the industry to hit the accelerator is to say, hey, let's pause. <laughs> yeah. People read that signal and say, hey, we need to be quick. Right, exactly. To get the, uh, the edge on the competition, right? Whether the competition is another company or another country. Brent, what are your thoughts on the topic of uh, ethics and how should we implement this in our AI systems? I think the, the big question is, is are, we, are we ready to be using these things? So I think um, the, the, the core thing of the data sets and the information that's been provided to these models, um, yeah, they're not curated. They're not, yeah, they're not understood. Um, you know, they're, they're open sources of information that everyone in here would go and say, well, Wikipedia, it's an okay source. It's not, it's not the definitive truth about something. It's a, it's a society's view at that, that point in time and can be edited many, many times. Um, you know, the, 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 the big ethical question for me is, you know, we're not telling people that, right? And so we're not informing the users that you know you shouldn't use this as a, as a definitive source of truth. Um, even when you go into organisations, I have built you know data platforms and solutions for so many organisations that just can't manage uh, you know simple structured information. The those same organisations still today struggle with managing simple structured information, and if they're going to go down the lines of feeding their challenging messes into a, a, a system like this is what, what answers they're going to get. It's, um, you know, I, I see organizations every single day that can't produce a simple BI report that is based off a warehouse. And then they're going to feed all of the information that's feeding the warehouse into something like ChatGDP. I guarantee you they're going to get worse, worse results from that um, than they would, you know, from getting a person to do it. So I think the, the big question for me is do it when you're ready. Um, look at the, the use cases that you know, mean that you're not going to cause problems for yourself, but also then inform the users about what it should and shouldn't be used for. How do you know when you're ready? I think that's a good question. Very good question. Um, when the uh, shareholders expect you to do it? No, uh, that's, uh, <laughs> that, that, there's some announcements in the newspapers today that uh, would uh, show exactly that. Um, I think when you understand the use case properly, right? I, I, I'm a big believer in AI-led transformation. Right? It, it is something that we're all going to be doing. It is the future of, of business today, but don't do it without understanding what the foundations are you need to build into first. Do it as a proper transformation program. Understand that you're going to be doing this for the long haul and start at the foundations. It's not a year journey. It's not just going in and getting all the data sources and throwing it straight into... A, a large you know, language model, don't do that. 
go and say, well, do I have sources that this is appropriate for? Have I curated my information properly? Do I have a use case that this, this is actually suitable? And then you'll know that you're ready, right? And then test the hell out of it, right? Understand, check bias, put it through proper engineering approaches that actually check these things and constantly and continuously check it because these things are continuously reinforcing themselves. So you need to continuously check that it actually works and it's doing what you expected. Um, when you have all of those in place and you have the frameworks and approaches, then, then start looking at it. Um, and then you won't cause huge amounts of risk to your organization. Excellent. Uh, you, you were talking about testing the hell out of it. That is a good segue into your question, Sarah, at the back regarding, uh, let me see, t ah, testing apps using AI, data related. There we go. <laughs> So, um, so perhaps you'd like to formulate that into a question again. I'm afraid uh, I'm not hugely adept at James's shorthand. Here we go. Thank you. Um, so exactly what you were saying where, you know, um, you've got an organization where the data is not really understood, where Power BI, you, you know, you're not able to do that, but companies are moving forward by developing apps that's using this data. And you know, I'm from the testing background. We've been handed over to go ahead and test this, approve it, so that we can go into production. Uh, I don't have solutions in terms of you know how do you go about and sign off on certain things when I know that the data itself is not correct. So there have been companies where I work where you know we've deployed things into production and learned from it and then made you know improvements. I'm, a, I'm an engineer at heart, and I got to say we got to move away from point in time testing. Yeah, it doesn't work. It's never worked. It very, very rarely does the job. Um, we have to think about these things as live, constant, continuous applications. So you need to, just like you're testing a person in your organization, are they still doing the right thing for you? Are you continuously interacting with them to know and coaching them as an individual? If you start putting in AI solutions into your systems, you need to have the same approaches and treat it in the same fashion. It's something that's going to continuously learn. So then you need, for, you need to have frameworks and approaches that continuously test this thing. It's all doable, but it's expensive, right? And so it's a risk payoff, right? And we all know what happens when, you know, at the moment when certain, you know, risk is a big thing, right? And it's, it's the reason why a lot of this machine learning type approaches haven't got a way out of marketing or haven't been implemented in, in different organizations because it's risky. But if you do build the right engineering frameworks, the right approaches, the manage your data in the right way and implement your platforms and solutions in the, in the appropriate way to do AI, you can do this with a less, you know, with, with, a, with a palatable risk. And I think that's the, that's the big thing. You can test bias. You can test how is this behave? What is the answer that you're going to get for different types of users or different personas? You know, you can get all that information. You can constantly continuously check it. And is it within the thresholds that you're, you know, able to deal with from a risk perspective? And that's what we need to look at. Sure. Thank you. Excellent. Thanks a lot. Awesome. God, the time flies. We have to get through these questions. Let's do it. No, no, no. All good. I love it. Go for it. Thank you. Just with the sort of the testing part and leaving it to engineers, sort of that feels to me like it's almost offset about really focusing on the ethics because I don't think engineers are good at ethics. They, they're they good at logic, um, but they're not ethicists and they're probably the worst ethicists because they can justify everything with numbers. Like how do you sort of balance that part of, that part of it? Because, you know, if we're talking about yeah, the ethical nature, having engineers being controlled, it seems a dangerous part of that. And maybe what led us to here. Yeah, I think I think you need to have that balanced, right? It's not engineers aren't the right person to be making that decision, but you can work with ethics people to do that. Um, there's a layman's test that you can put on all these models. I've worked with organizations where we've literally had somebody like a, you know, even a, you know, it could be a PA or it could be anyone to actually go and say, well, does this pass the pub test? right? Is this ethical? You can then work with professional people that, are, you know, really are in, super involved in ethics in regards to this, but all of those can be codified to an extent, you know, in rules to make sure that you're meeting your basic expectations. And that's what needs to be codified from the, by the engineering point of view. 
And it needs to, they, they also, engineers need to start thinking about it. If you're going to be a machine learning engineer and a data scientist, then you should think about it. It, it shouldn't be a question that's an afterthought because this is a cool piece of technology I want to play with. Thanks, thanks a lot. <clears throat> Ethicist, that's quite a difficult word to pronounce after a couple of beers. Um, let's move on to privacy, privacy smaller players. Who's Question was that? That's that's a good one. Oh, oh, there we go. While well, I'm in the neighbourhood. <laughs> Sorry, now that was more around just observation that a lot of companies are saying don't use AI because of once you once you use it, the data's there, and there seems to be a slowing down of the uptake of in controlled environments and what's going to be needed to speed that up again. Yeah, we sort of find ourselves at a really interesting sort of juncture where there's opposing forces at the moment. So. You know, particularly with sort of Optus and Latitude and Co with their breaches, you've got a lot of big corporates, at least the ones I'm associated with at the moment, really trying to catch up to sort of lock down their data. A lot of companies rationalizing how much data they keep now. I even I think today, I think it was Snowflake sort of in their earnings call for in the US was sort of talking about how they're sort of seeing a slower growth pattern just because instead of keeping five or six years data, companies are now going, oh, maybe let's just keep three or four just because the risk it sort of uh, presents in that privacy uh, space and you know, data breach space. But then you've got sort of these large language models and things like that that drive on that volume of data. So there's sort of these two competing priorities at the moment. It's gonna be really interesting to sort of see how that goes. And then, you know, how do you safely keep a lot of this data, but the really valuable data, particularly from a commercial viewpoint in retail and stuff like that is people data, you know, customer data, PI data. So. Um, it's going to be really interesting to see how companies surmount that. And there's a lot of catch up being done, even just in the breach side of stuff earlier. You know, a lot of companies sort of suddenly sort of seeing all the risk in their portfolio with their data. But then along comes this innovation, and it's like, oh, hold on. <laughs> you know, do we want to get rid of that data because it actually might be quite valuable to them? So it's going to be a, a bit of a trade off. Um, Maybe that's the third. Yeah, I, I think you know, we'll sort of start to see that sort of creep through. And normally it's going to be the EU or someone like that that will front run this. Um, you've seen like, I mean, Italy kicked out um, chat GPT straight away. Um, you know, some of the privacy concerns and things like that. So um, we'll see if, if uh, the normal group will sort of run it. California is probably one of the other places that sort of go pretty well with their privacy and stuff. But um, also companies will self um, regulate to some extent depending on the value of the brands and things like that. You know, what else is a big conglomerate that they sort of work for? You know, that privacy and data, you know, privacy sort of consideration in this is, is pretty front and center. They have to find some sort of sort of change and associate with some sort of regulation. How do they do that, by the way? How do you ban it in a country? Can you just like switch it off like that? Yeah, I think that, I, I mean, I'm sure there's a whole bunch of VPN activity going through to get to it if you wanted to, but um, I'm, you know, from a geocoding sort of viewpoint, you can lock that down. And there's been a number of companies lock it out. You know, uh, Samsung had to lock it out once they sort of found that their source code and strategy was floating around through that GPT. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, there's a bunch of companies that are banning it. Um, we're sort of just waiting at West Farmers to see where the policy will land. Um, caution in the air, I would say. Mm, okay. And it's always best to err on the side of caution. History has taught us. Is anyone here um, not allowed to use it at work? Just out of curiosity. Oh, wow. Okay, cool. Is everyone else using it all day, every day? Yeah, yeah. Okay, interesting. Okay, yeah, exactly. We're all, we're all um, running to catch up, aren't we? All right, let's uh, tackle this question regarding um, so thoughts TF, what does the TF stand for? Oh, oh timeframes, time <laughs> big, ch big changes in business. Whose question was that? Excellent. Perhaps if you wouldn't mind rephrasing it. <laughs> sure. So, so you've talked a bit about uh, not to trust the output of what we're seeing at the moment. And I don't think we're gonna see like a financial advisor replaced or an accountant replaced with a, an AI just yet. Um, but where do you think you'll see the first big changes in the way we work um, that will really, you'll see a big change in the way organizations operate? 
my, my view is I think we're already seeing it. It's maybe it's just not as public, but I think Copilot was the first one. The, the productivity gains from Copilot are phenomenal, right? Uh, when Microsoft releases Copilot in the office suites, I think, again, the consulting might be uh, a, a really, you know, there'll be huge productivity gains in there again. So I, I think we're already seeing it. But if this is year one, you know, in the fast forward to year five, it's it's unknowable what the future is going to look like. I, I am optimistic because I see it as like a general purpose technology, you know. How does the economy change? How does business change? How do interfaces change? Platforms change? Search changes? Uh, that is unknown. Nobody knows it. I do think, though, and I mentioned this previously, I do think data will go dark. I think companies will take their data off the internet. It will not become a training set for another large language model. You do not you want to keep your secret source to yourself. And data is an asset. We knew it's an asset. But I think these large language models allow you to utilize that data in a commercial way that's never been done before. Um, and if open AI's algorithm and large language model can tell somebody else more about your company than you can, I, I think you're a danger. When you say go dark, do you mean like removing all web presence? So I, I think, for instance, Twitter might decide that they're not going to open source their data anymore. Wow, it's incredible. That, that's another interesting thing. They call themselves open AI, but it's not open at all, is it, really? 10 billion, how you go closed pretty quickly after 10 billion investment. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. The whole um, human AI collaboration piece is really interesting. Like, um, what successful examples of human AI collaboration have you seen? You mentioned Copilot earlier. Um, how do we strike the balance between improving efficiency and still valuing human expertise, intuition, those sorts of things. I mean, the more we use this, are we going to, you know, like if you don't work out, you get a bit flabby, right? Is it, is it going to be that sort of thing? Do we have to be careful? I think there's the mundane tasks will be automated away. Uh, question, I think we had this discussion maybe a little bit earlier is about the art and soul of the human input into certain things like music, like pictures, paintings. Uh, you know, these models, the generative diffusion models seem to be producing really interesting, beautiful artwork. But, you know, is that really art or is that just a generated machine? There's something about the scarcity of human intuition and soul being placed into uh, artwork that makes it really interesting it's the lived experience that I don't think these AI models have. Uh, but product, you know, mundane tasks and productivity gains, I think, will be massive. The uh, I saw an incredible piece of art today that was a series of uh, plumbers' friends, plungers. I don't know if anyone else has seen this AI piece of art, but it's extraordinary. And it wrote this blurb, and it's just like, oh, my God, this is just so creative. How can people say that this thing can't think for itself. But I, I guess all art to a certain extent is a regurgitation of what went before. Uh, it's, it's, it's a derivative of what went before in some shape or form. Maybe that's a cynical way of looking at it. I'm not sure. A lived experience. A lived experience. It's expression of a lived experience that you've had um, or thought about. Absolutely. Absolutely. Plungers, yeah, check it out. So it's incredible. It's amazing. It's like the evolution of a plunger. You know, the... Um, the depiction of man from when we were like a primate to being Homo erectus walking upright. It's incredible. Check it out. Um, all right. So then we had a very interesting question from you, Alzan, I think, wasn't it? Regarding short term. Oh, sorry. There we go. Yes. So in the short term, it seems like a lot of companies have got an idea of what they're doing, starting to think about how they use LLMs, you know, turning on Copilot, all those sorts of things. But when the, the whole area seems to be evolving so quickly and it's sort of such a sort of grey view into the future, um, what's your view on is, is it possible to long term do long-term planning on how we use these technologies or do we just sort of throw up our hands and see what happens? 
that creates a, a really interesting um, sort of opportunity, you know, with the conservatism of maybe some of the bigger companies with their brand image and things like that we're talking about in terms of privacy and stuff like that. That creates opportunity for smaller, more nimble players in the market to, to sort of leverage that and get going. Um, you know, real bigger organisations then start to try copy that and then monetize it. Um, you know, especially with the recent sort of explosion of the uh, LLM and stuff like that. You know, I don't think anyone's really knowing exactly where they're sort of going to land and how they're going to use it. Like, is there application for it in call centres? You know, there's a lot of thinking going into it at the moment. And I'm sure a lot of consultancies will love to come in and tell us how to, how to do it um, and that sort of thing um, and help us along that sort of journey. But um, in terms of, you know, it's hard enough to get sort of data governance and normal reporting and stuff into it. So um, I think when there's commercial opportunities that come up, um, or you can see sort of bigger, more nimble players in the market doing it, that's where you see that really driven. Um, stuff like that. Um, that can kind of use each other along the way, um, so to speak, particularly in retail and things like that. Absolutely. Plagiarism is the highest form of flattery. Um, all right, great. Alzan, your question. It was a beauty. Please let us have it again. Um, so I did ask it around engineering, but I think it's a lot broader than that. So basically anything to your point earlier that is repeat, repeatable or repeating itself can be automated by some form of AI. So how do you predict our um, efficiencies transforming over the next couple of years if we start using this smartly? Probably. So probably like my uh, engineering team, they'll play a lot of table tennis. Um, so <laughs> definitely, um, I think the team that's involved in the area, especially beyond Okay, great. So the subject of governance has come up quite a lot. Um, if you were a think tank uh, advising the government on what to do next with regards to legislation, what advice would you give them? What, what way should we be like as organizations now that this is a, a daily part of our lives, we're all using it, whether it's at home or in the office, a lot of people seem to still be using it in the office at this point. Uh, what would you like to see in terms of upskilling, like in terms of preparing people for this, whether it's uh, employees in, in the office or whether it's kids in schools, what sort of education and awareness would you like to see? to catch up with where we are.
Right. All right. And what about you, Rick and Fred, in your... I I'm typically uh, don't like government or regulation um, overbearing the industries, except where there's danger to society. And so in this case, I think where there is liability questions in the, and the gray, it is most probably appropriate for gov government to step in and put a framework out there around, you know, even you know, government even do the same thing with their robo tax thing. So they use the AI model over there and they've been caught out in that, in that way as well. So a, a framework was probably around liability and the ethical use of machine learning and uh, large language models and the damage it could cause to society would make organizations must probably think about how they approach these tools and how do they um, how do they deploy them into the broader society without a framework it's still very much uh, you know uh, wild west out there really you uh, were talking about copilot and how um, you said that you your developers use it and you said something about sometimes you question whether or not it they they perhaps look into the quality of the code that they're producing, or I, I kind of sense that there was a maybe that they were becoming a little bit too relaxed about it, like trusting it too much, maybe with their development, not not checking their homework enough. Was there something a nuance of that? It's inevitable, it's right? Inevitable. It's inevitable. You know, if, if I've got something that can make me a lot more productive, and I've got a little bit of trust now in this. You know, I'll start trusting it more until that trust is broken. Um, you, but I mean, the, the big but here is you need to quality control everything. You need to review everything. You need to test everything. Um, but if it passes those tests, yeah, it's productivity gains you get, right? The question is, what does engineering and development look like in the next five years? Is it supervision or is it really fingers on keyboards? Right. So what, what have you... What what how do you manage your your developers to kind of counteract that? Like what sort of structures or frameworks do you put in place? We review obviously we've got strict quality control mechanisms okay. within within Pixel, so, but um, yeah, that's the only. But if you pass those, what do you? If if it's the code is right, if it's writing code at the seventy fifth percentile of all developers, right? You can't question that. You you know it works. So it's pretty good. It's pretty it does good. a pretty good job. It does a pretty good job. Okay. Not 100% good, but uh, it's like 70% good. Okay. All right. Rick, you were saying that um, West Farmers was still making up its mind. What are their concerns and, and what sort of things would you put in place if, if it were left up to you? I think the uh, education pieces you know, that we've been talking about is the really important piece. Um, you know, I think people often, particularly with chat GPT and stuff like that, take any responses being sort of gospel or you know, a fact or truth. Um, you know, we need to sort of really educate people about that. Also turning off the settings and not contribute to the model where they've got a strategy paper involved or something like that. But, um, and I think, you know, companies are always going to be playing a bit of catch up there just because the innovation is so quick at the moment. Um, so, you know, there's going to be interesting challenges along that way. Um, you know, this sort of on that sort of topic of, you know, that, governance and sort of legislative piece sort of thing, you know, we've just got to be so careful that we're not reinforcing sort of, you know, whether it be racial or gender or socioeconomic sort of uh, biases and things through whatever sort of use these models have. Um, you know, maybe a bit of a challenge for the uh, insurance actuary industry, uh, which sort of bases things on that sort of thing. But, you know, there's going to be some really interesting conversations that need to be had. And, you know, it's, the good governments will be the ones that sort of can get out in front of that a little bit, but you know, often government doesn't. So, yeah, it'd be interesting. Probably and, be company led. Awesome. Awesome. I think that we're running out of time. So, I just want to ask before we wrap up if there are any final questions for our very wise panel. No? Oh, excellent. Thanks for the, the chat, everyone. I just want to ask what the panel thinks about the economics of especially large language models, generational AI, um, you know, chat, chat GPT, like a drug dealer, they've got us hooked on the free version. 
Um, you know, you can pay 20 bucks a month. Bard is free. Um, you know, these companies are losing a ton of money ser serving these models at the moment. If you want to take them into the enterprise, transactionally, they could be quite expensive to use. Like where do you figure out, you know, how to monetize it or where to use it within within the enterprise? My view is it's it's going to be values driven, it's like uh, Chat GPT or GPT four. You know, it's producing a lot of productivity gains. So you we're probably willing to pay for that in lieu of another expense that you have within your organization. My bigger concern is where does the value accrue to? And it seems like it's going to be accruing to a couple of large organizations, right? If if all organizations don't have that same capability, you know, Microsoft, AWS, uh, OpenAI, these models with this level of sophistication, those will be the only places you can go and get that. Now, I am seeing a very interesting open source um, movement in this area, specifically led by the leak of Meta's Llama model, and then Stanford updating that and creating their own Vacuna. So there might be this outside influence, which is the open source community just works at a different rate. And actually the economics favor community or development at large versus a couple of big players in the game. Fantastic, great question. Thank you very much. It looks like that's all we have time for. So uh, I'll hand you back to James, but before I do, thank you very much, Rick, Fred and Brent. It was enlightening. <laughs> Thank you so much. Really appreciate it. And of course, a big round of applause for Will, a wonderful MC. Thank you, Will. Um, yeah, look, as, as Will mentioned, uh, thanks again to the panel. Thanks again to the ELX team. Um, and again, thanks again for Zendesk for giving us their space. It is much appreciated. Um, I think there'll be more topics to come on AI. I think we're only scratching the surface, really. Um, and it's exciting and scary at the same time. Um, again, please click on the uh, QR code. Uh, we want to get your votes in. It's all, you know, uh, you guys that choose the next topic. Uh, we'll be back in August. Um, enjoy the pizza and crack on with the wine and beers. Thank you very much. Thank you.